Um, yeah, the convener was just asking um, if there are apologies. We have apologies from Councillor uh, Benny and Councillor Robertson. Thank you, Brian. Um, can I ask if there are any declarations of interest? No declaration. Thank you. Thank you. Just before we move on to the business, um, scrutiny is open. The scrutiny committee is open to everyone, so I'm, I'm pleased to see Councillor Kelly, Councillor Spears uh, on the call. Thanks for joining us, gents. And we'll now move on to the business of the, the meeting. Um, we have the minute of the scrutiny committee held on the 8th of September 2022. Does anyone have any comments or? And I think no, I think there's general agreement convener that that's that's been agreed as a correct record. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Provost, Councillor uh, uh, Forrest, thank you. We'll now move on to uh, the rolling action log and I'll open up if anyone has any questions regarding the uh, issues that may have arisen from the rolling action log. I think convener just to say that all the actions have been updated um, and where dates are given for reports and um, they have been so I noticed that the report in the pupil equity fund which the committee had asked for and I think had um, initially had scheduled for the, this meeting um, with the word from children's services that that report will be coming to the next meeting there's a special meeting and on the 15th of December and the report will be available for that meeting. Thank you, uh, Mr. Perry. Um, I did have a couple of um, what I thought were concerns that reports that may not have been coming in front of the uh, the committee here, but it turned out I was actually looking at a draft uh, of our agenda and it had been subsequently updated. So just as uh, Mr. Perry has indicated, uh, these reports will be coming uh, forward um, probably to the next um, scrutiny committee. OK. Um, if we can then move on to the the only item really on the agenda, the Local Government Scotland Overview Report. Um, I'm quite sure that there will be uh, some questions, but uh, perhaps if we could uh, ask for uh, Mrs Algie if she wanted to uh, give us a, a, an update on what's actually involved in the, in the report, uh, Mrs Algie. Either uh, Rebecca McDonald's on the call and she'll take you through the report if that's okay with yourself, convener. Thanks. That's absolutely fine. Uh, thank you, uh, Cam. Thanks, convener, uh, and good morning, everyone. This is a paper covering, as the convener said, the local government in Scotland overview, overview report. We report it to this committee and it looks back at the Accounts Commission's report published in May of this year, and there is a link to that report in the paper. This is a national report to which we provide local context on how the Council is responding to the national messages and recommendations set out by the Commission. Paragraph 4.1 in the report sets out the six key messages identified by the Accounts Commission that they feel are impacting Councils generally, such as the impact of the pandemic, and the wider challenges and the difficult context that local government is operating in. The Commission's report has a focus on recovery and renewal, and paragraph 4.4 in the paper sets out the three themes that the Commission has focused on in this respect. So those themes are, one, responding to the external environment, two, organising the Council with a lens on topics such as leadership, resources and workforce. And the third theme is around meeting local needs and they've put a focus on inequality. So the council was asked to set out responses to themes two and three to show what we are doing regarding the recommendations made for organising the council and meeting local needs. And these responses are presented in appendix one in the paper today. 
Much of the information in the appendix aligns with the findings in the Council's Base Value Audit report from earlier this year, and much of the Council response that you'll read for each of the recommendations already forms part of the Council's existing plans. The key takeaways to highlight from the narrative in the appendix would be, in particular, the work undertaken with officers and members to develop and approve the core strategic plans that the Council needs to steer the way forward. Those plans are namely the Falkirk Plan that was developed and put in place by the Community Planning Partnership, the Best Value Strategic Action Plan, which was approved by Council in February as a result of the Best Value Audit Report that we received. And both the Falkirk Plan and the Best Value Strategic Action Plan helped us determine the new Council Plan, which was approved in September, so a number of weeks ago now, but that council plan gave us the council vision, a set of priorities, it recapped on the council values that we have, and a performance management framework to take the work of the council forward. And the council plan was complemented by the financial strategy. And I think all of these strategies really will help us, or help the council harness the efforts that we need to focus on the sub themes that the commission called out to help us the way forward with leadership, resources, workforce and inequality, as they've outlined in their report. So these strategic plans give the Council leverage to further improve and develop how we do organise the Council and meet local needs. And you will note in the appendix that we've included a RAG assessment, the red amber green status, to indicate how we feel the Council's current performance is against each recommendation cited. We did note that there are some amber assessments that have been made, um, but given that, for example, the council plan and the financial strategy were approved you know, just a number of weeks ago in their five-year plans, we need to get a focus now on getting the work done within those plans to drive the improvements needed and aim for a green status across the areas of work cited over time and where possible. So to conclude, convener, I would refer the committee to the recommendations in the report and would say that compiling the council response to the accounts commission was actually a collaborative piece of work uh, involving a num numerous officers across the council and I would invite those officers in the call today to help and take any questions that the committee has. So thank you convener and I'll pass back. Thank you very much for that uh, Rebecca uh, and it's nice of you to offer uh, to open it up to the other council officers who are on the call. I'm quite sure that they will come in should anything arise from any questions that the members may have. So I'm going to open it up to uh, members of the committee if they do have any, any questions. Councillor Forrest. Thank you. I, it's actually message four on page 16. Some of the services have not yet returned to pre-pandemic levels. What services are they actually referring to? And have, are there any reasons for this? I don't know which one. I, you are the, just the very point I was about to make, uh, Councillor Forrest. I think that's um, quite uh, wide ranging. So it probably goes to uh, each of the uh, the directors or officers who are on the call. It is, um, thank you. Should we go to, I'm taking a, a bit of a prompt here from Mr. Perry. Perhaps if uh, Mr. Laurie, could you maybe uh, kick this off, uh, Kenneth, please? Um, thank you, um, convener, and uh, morning, uh, everyone. I suppose that. Um, in terms of the report, what the Accounts Commission um, are getting at is the fact that there's been a huge level of disruption um, as a result um, of COVID um, to services right across um, the Council. And that has both impacted on our ability um, to deliver um, some of these uh, services, and it's also impacted on the uh, public reaction and response and usage of services. So, I mean, simply to take, I suppose, from my mind, an obvious um, example uh, would be uh, services around about leisure. So, these are the services that came in from uh, the Community Trust 
uh, were run by the Bruton Community Trust up until April of this year and now run by the, um, the council. And clearly during the period of the pandemic, um, these services for long periods weren't um, being used. And the return to these, the, the use of services has taken time. And that's partly about um, our ability to open them up and run these services again. And it's partly about the uh, public's willingness to re-engage in some of these services. So that's just one example. And I suppose um, just to pick perhaps one other before um, uh, directors might want to come in and, 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 and comment, um, think about the impact of the pandemic in relation to health and social care and uh, the, the demand uh, for services, the pressure on um, well, particularly um, staffing resources in relation to, for example, uh, social care, where our, we still have significant numbers of vacancies um, which we're unable to fill. I think the last time I heard it was in the region of 100, and that has a huge impact on our ability uh, to deliver services to the public. So um, what I think the Accounts Commission is reflecting is the kind of the dislocation in the economy, in society, which resulted from the pandemic, the impact that has had on um, services, on public use of services, on the workforce, and the fact that we then need to um, change our model, change our approach and respond um, to these challenges. So, uh, Convener, that's perhaps a pretty broad response to that, but I'll uh, perhaps pass on to um, others who may want to talk about specific services in their area. Councillor Follis, do you have any? I thank you for that very full answer. I thank you very much for that. Um, Councillor Anslow. Um, thank you, Councillor McCabe. I was just going to ask the question around um, the equalities. Um, it's a keen interest, keen interest of mine being a senior. senior. Uh, equality uh, rep for uh, since the, the first inaugurated 14 years ago. So I'm just wondering how the council plan has considered the equality's implications and uh, what will be the key indicators for monitoring this. Can I ask uh, Mrs. Algy if she could uh, respond to Councillor Anslow there, please? Happy to convene her and thank you. It's a really important question, Councillor Anslow, and something which has to be um, right at the front and the forefront of our thoughts when we're delivering any services as equalities. So the Council plan has a priority within it around tackling inequality and directly trying to do work which addresses um, that particular issue. In terms of um, straightforward process, though, we have our equality impact assessments which we should be undertaking when we're assessing any type of work that we're doing to ensure that we are taking account of the impact it has on equality and inequality. And I suppose part of that is also very much around um, poverty, which can impact on equality aspects as well. And there's a huge amount of work going on. There'll be a report coming to Council on poverty in December. Um, so there's a huge amount of work going on to tackle some of those issues as well, which can clearly impact on equality of opportunity for different individuals too. I hope that helps to address your question. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Algy. I think we'll, we will be asking some further questions on the uh, equality uh, impact assessments. Um, does anyone else have any any questions that they would like to perhaps lead on that? OK, I'll come, I'll come back to you, uh, Councillor Aitchin. Um, just on the equalities impact then, um, uh, page 23, um, I, th I feel it's, it, just as Councillor Angelo has alluded to, um, we are perhaps not utilising uh, equality impact assessments as well as we should. I don't 
this is not a criticism of anyone at all. This is more, uh, I feel, a learning process uh, for councillors and council officers, how we how we actually um, pull together uh, the uh, equality impact assessments. Um, I suppose what we, I think as a, as a way forward, what I'd be looking at is that councillors perhaps become uh, more proactively involved with um, council officers uh, when equality impact assessments are coming in front of us uh, for any um, agenda item at all. I'm just wondering, I'm thinking perhaps, Mr. Laurie, if you could uh, maybe respond. Do you feel that council, uh, council groups um, uh, should be perhaps meeting earlier with uh, council officers to discuss the uh, formulation of equality impact assessments, um, just so that we're satisfied that <laughs> the information which comes through the impact assessments is fully assessed by councillors before they're being presented as addendums or supporting material to reports, so that we don't come along uh, at such an, a later stage and the equality impact assessment is almost sidelined. Do you feel it would be beneficial perhaps if um, we did have uh, earlier uh, discussions between council officers compiling the reports before those reports are eventually uh, presented to council? Thank you, convener. I mean, it's, it's an interesting question. I mean, I suppose my, um, the broader view, and this was, it was set out in the response to S. Valley. It's reflected in this report because of the training opportunities we're putting in place with officers and members. There's another training session, um, I think, in December that are bringing um, officers and members to um, together to explore issues around about equalities. And I guess that's the place to fully um, have, have a fuller discussion around about that. But I think the the broader point is a recognition that particularly given the pressures on um, council services um, and on resources and the significant changes that implies over the coming period, that considering the equalities implications of that is going to be a really important um, aspect of it. And the fact that we're doing this training is in itself a recognition. We've got more work to do on this area. And I think what's important for um, members to recall uh, and think about when reports are coming forward is that there is that equalities impact assessment work in the background and if members do have concerns then they have the uh, the opportunity you know to ask about that um, and and to ensure that that is fully considered in the uh, when we're, we're looking at various reports so i think the training is going to be really important for this um, convener, and I think that might help us establish a more um, robust process where uh, members feel you know co confident and and comfortable to uh, to talk about these issues, to challenge if they think that's uh, necessary, and indeed where officers are ensuring that um, the robust work on EPIAs is being done in the background in relation to any report that comes forward. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Laurie. It's excellent. I'm uh, delighted to hear that uh, the the indication that there is a uh, training uh, coming forward in December. Mr. Perry had uh, indicated that to me just prior to the meeting there, and and I believe that you're right. Uh, the fact that that training is taking place that will allow the dialogue to open up and expand a bit with the uh, councillors and, and officers, and hopefully we can. Um, hone in on the the value of the, the EPIAs. Um, it was interesting earlier on this morning, we had a, a little discussion about it, where EPIAs, um, they are, they don't prevent us from making decisions, but they give us additional information which allows us to make those decisions. So uh, I'm, I'm really pleased to hear uh, your comments there, uh, uh, Mr. Laurie. Um, 
I see that uh, uh, Councillor Spears has his hand up. Would you care to come in, uh, Councillor Spears? Yeah, thank you very much, Convener. Uh, the title of this uh, agenda item is Local Government for Scotland Overview Report. If you could turn to page 18 uh, and agenda item 4.5, it clearly lays out the priorities. Social care reform, Brexit, climate change, long-standing and growing demographic pressures, growing cost of living, and the recovery from COVID-19. There is some, some of this has been addressed in the appendixes. But if you turn to page 24 and you read the actions for leadership, council should have a clear plan for developing the use of data in their councils. Now, it's not so much a question as an observation. Having looked at the future plans for other councils in Scotland, and the, there is proposals in some councils to put up their council tax by 6%, can we afford to carry out these recommendations? And I would Thank like you. to, I would like to have seen a, a, a full explanation of how we wish to carry that. Thank you, uh, Councillor Spears. I think that's a question for uh, the Chief Executive, Mr. Laurie. Would you like to come back and respond? Yeah, I will uh, come in back in, convener. Thank you. And I think specifically on the data um, aspect, um, which is which Councillor Spears cited, I'll, I'll perhaps ask Rebecca to come in briefly um, after me. Um, in terms of um, the question, can we afford uh, to pursue these recommendations, I mean the, rec the 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 recommendations, as Rebecca said in her introduction, relate to all local authorities. But I think we recognise the relevance of them to us, and as was said, you know, they 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 they, um, they sit very strongly alongside our own um, best value action plan and um, the, the the actions we've agreed as a result of that. So um, I don't think as a council, given that um, the Accounts Commission um, is pointing out that these are critical issues for all councils, I don't think we can not um, address them or not consider them. And I think actually uh, dealing with the issues cited in the Local Government Overview Report are part of the way in which we address the challenges that are in front of us. So I don't think we can um, uh, afford not um, to fully um, address and consider these uh, these issues. And in relation to the the point about um, data, and uh, as I say, I'll, I'll uh, with your agreement, convener, uh, ask Rebecca to come in. I think the effective use of um, data and information is a critical part of the uh, efficient and forward-looking council that we're trying um, to be. So um, I think all of the recommendations are relevant. I think the, the issue about data is a, a very important aspect of that, but I'll I'll, I'll press with your agreement, uh, uh, convener, pass on to Rebecca for some commentary on that. Thank you, Mr. Laurie. Rebecca, please, thank you. Thank you, convener. So as the Chief Executive outlined there, there is a piece of work underway now uh, following the approval of the council plan to make more effective use of the data and information that we have, to share that more widely across the organisation so that we have consistency in the baseline evidence that we have to inform projects, plans, programmes of work that we need to undertake. Um, it's all contained in the Council Plan to make sure that we are baselining effectively and can set projections, um, both in terms of performance targets, but actually making sure that, bringing in Councillor Spears' point, that we have a pragmatic approach to setting targets and setting aims that we know can be pragmatically achieved. Now, part of this project, uh, so whilst we need to sort of scoop up the data and, and sort of bring it together so we have a kind of centralised and coordinated approach to how we use that data, is how we present the data so that we can understand it 
and also look at ways of getting it into the public domain so the public can have better and improved access to that information and make sure it's clear and understandable. And whilst this is the right thing to do, it also tackles some of the audit feedback that we've had that we need to kind of improve our approach to all of this. But as I say, this project is a project plan just currently being developed and we would hope to make some inroads into this during 2023. And um, so we're just going through the process just now of identifying the resources to make this happen. But we would look to see a shift um, early doors in 2023 and then progressively over the next over the course of the next year to see more evidence of us getting better at this so get the data make it more centrally coordinated and available and look at the presentation of it so that it is clearer and more understandable so thanks convener thank you very much for your response uh, Ms. mcdonald uh, councillor spears would you care to come back and anything that's been commented on no, thanks. Thanks for the comments, but I did, uh, as a spectre at the end, raise the the cost of this, um, and nobody's really answered how uh, they want to address that. Perhaps I could pass that over to Amanda to see if we uh, if we have some money in the kitty, Amanda. If you would like to come in, please. Um, thank you, convener. Uh, I'm not sure if, we've, if I can say we've got money in, in the kitty. I think um, what I would say is we are trying to look at the range of data that we have across the systems um, and we're trying to work out how we can perhaps organise and bring forward some, uh, bring together some of that data and information in a more sort of efficient, streamlined way. So I think at this stage, our focus is trying to do as much as we can with the resources we have. Um, but I think it may come a point where we have to consider whether we use, for example, some of our change fund or some of our other resources to maybe improve some of the um, arrangements that we have if need be. But I don't think we're quite at that stage yet of knowing what that might cost and if if we need to um, find additional funds and if, where those funds would come from. So I don't, I don't think we're quite there yet. Thank you, Mrs. Templeman. Uh, Councillor Spears, does that um, uh, satisfy you at all? Um, it would appear that things are in hand. We will be looking if there are any additional uh, financial impacts, um, then we would obviously be looking uh, to fund that in some way. But it appears just at the minute that we will be handling um, just by uh, streamlining uh, our existing systems. Have you got any comments on that, uh, Councillor Spear? I would say it raises more questions than answers. Um, and it's all very fine for a Scottish-wide um, report like this to come forward. But uh, unless it's financed and we know how we're going to pay for things, then, you know, that's where the questions arise. We're looking at um, a massive hike in council taxes coming in the next budget. And we want to incorporate and work with the communities we represent. And they want to know they're getting value for money. So we, we want things to be costed so we know where we are. OK, Councillor Spears, thanks very much for your comments. It's obviously something that we'll revisit uh, later. Um, but if I could, um, uh, Provost uh, Bishop. I, I just wanted to um, touch on the EPIAs. Can you hear me OK? On the EPIAs, I think given the level of savings that we face this year and the dire situation we're in, the EPIAs will be a, a key factor in the decision making process. So I'm glad to hear we're getting more, there's more training coming along. But in previous years, when we've been presented with uh, service changes, we've perhaps not had the EPIAs in front of us and we've had to push for them. So I just want to ask uh, Mr Laurie if, if we'll have these in a timely fashion. So when we're presented with, each group is presented with the, the, the challenges we face, will we have these EPIAs in time? Um, so we shouldn't have to be chasing for them, because there might. You, know, I think what you'll probably find this year 
is there'll be a, a greater level of scrutiny of EPIAs than there has been in the past, because that is really going to impact on our decision making process. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Provost. Uh, just before I pass over to Mr. Laurie, I would um, I would hope that uh, from Mr. Laurie's earlier uh, answer uh, that there there is a training or seminars in September that we will be um, uh, councils will be uh, getting better informed, and I would hope that. Uh, as I said, the, the, I think at the beginning of the meeting, it's a, a kind of learning process for us here where we are, uh, councillors are engaging or will be engaging more and possibly earlier with officers. So um, I think we are on the right track, but I'll op open it up to Mr Laurie to respond to you. Could, could I just add that um, I think it's going to be interesting to find out how an EPIA is actually formulated and how officers go about collecting the data and pulling that together to actually arrive at that um, a quote, a, a, the, the impact statement. So we, we know how it's how it's done. I think in the past we've been presented with it and we've perhaps never really questioned it. But I think um, where we are, just I think we will be questioning that really. Uh, Mr Laurie, would, uh, would you care to respond at all? Yes, thank you, um, convener. I mean, you're absolutely right to say it's a learning um, uh, process. And I think the training will um, absolutely help address the point that Councillor Bissett just uh, raised that latter point he made. Um, in, in terms of EPIAs more, more generally, I mean, officers are very aware that EPIAs need to be developed in conjunction with developing proposals. They're not something which um, uh, can or should be done um, retrospectively. Um, and the training, of course, is em emphasising and will emphasise uh, the importance um, of that. So I think um, in terms of the uh, the budget proposals, and, and Councillor Bissett, of course, is 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 right that given the, the sheer scale of the reduction in resources which the Council will face next year, this um, the kind of decisions that will be coming before councillors over the next few months are kind of unprecedented um, uh, compared to what you've seen um, previously. And that makes the, the whole issue around about EPIA is particularly important. So um, recognising the, the uh, importance of this, and I think that um, the training will take us to a, a better place than we've been in previously. Thank you, convener. Thank you, Mr. Laurie. Could I ask uh, Mrs. Algie if um, if she's perhaps is there anything further to input in uh, perhaps the development of the uh, the uh, the seminar uh, the training uh, for councillors? Hi, convener. Happy to come in on that point. Um, I think the training for for councillors. We've we've already had uh, an event. Just a couple of weeks ago, which if members were unable to attend, I think Brian kindly um, sent us all a copy of the video from that. So that provided some really good information on the EPIA process and what it's all about and how we need to take account of that in the decision making process. And the event in December is to further develop that at a local level within Falkirk and how we work together as officers and members to make sure that we're looking at the equality aspects and that members do understand what is in, sits behind the EPIA process and the work that's done, but also so that officers understand what it is members feel they need to know in terms of uh, the decision-making process to ensure that that's appropriately, the EPIA is appropriately considered. Um, from there, that, you know, if there is further work that we need to do uh, together with members and officers, that's certainly something that we can look at as part of the overall development programme for members and officers. And in addition to that, uh, early in the new year, we're looking at a specific um, session with uh, officers, with managers, heads of service and directors to further develop the work that we do on the EPIA process and ensure that it's as robust as it possibly can be. It's an ongoing process to make sure that we continue to get better at this and continue to develop what we need to make sure that members have the right information to make the decisions that they need to make. I hope that helps. Thanks. 
No, that was uh, that was wonderful, Mrs. Algie. Thank you. Um, it, um, it highlights, I think, I use the term uh, a learning process. You've used the term a development process. I think that's exactly what it is. Um, the whole EPIA thing is um, it is critical in supporting councillors in uh, arriving at uh, any decisions that we're being asked to asked to take. And I know that. It, um, I, I must apologise. Uh, hold my hand up uh, to the fact that I couldn't make the uh, the last meeting. So I'm, uh, my intention is to have a look at the the, the video that you mentioned, where uh, some good points came out about the development of uh, the EPIA process. Again, learning development. It's, it's whatever it is, but it is. I believe it will be critically important to the council going forward, and it is that important. Uh, I see Councillor Angel, obviously, uh, who's concerns about the EPIA and the impacts it has. So I'll pass over to Councillor Anzo. Thank you, Convener. You'll be, you'll be pleased to know it's a straightforward question which just needs a yes or no answer. Given my um, long-term equalities background, um, I'm just wondering, out of curiosity, whether the Council actually has a designated equalities officer similar to a designated health and safety officer. Good question, uh, Mr. Laurie or Mrs. Algy. Yeah, I'm happy to come in on that convener. Uh, we do have an equalities officer, and we're also in the process of looking at how we can enhance uh, the work that we do on equalities by further support in there. So yes is the answer. I like those type of questions and I love those type of answers. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, does anyone have any uh, more questions, further questions on EPIA or um, consolations? Did you have a? Yeah, um, thanks, convener. Um, it was moving away from the EPIA. Um, it goes back to partly for Councillor Forrest's question, and, and Mr. Laurie did answer it to a certain extent. It's on page 16. Um, and it's a key measure three. Um, the workforce continues to experience higher absence levels. And this was the local government in Scotland overview. I'd like to see how Falkirk fits into that. Um, and I give, I take Mr. Laurie's point that due to COVID and things like that, we're, we're now moving away from that. Guidance for isolation has changed. Um, so we should have more uh, staff members back. But I think there was um, issues regarding staff well-being, um, whether it be uh, burnout or work-related stress. I would just like to see what uh, mechanisms have been put in to address this, please. Thank you, Councillor Hitchens. And uh, Mrs Algy, I believe that would fall under your remit. Thank you, Councillor Yeah, Yeah, it's a really important point, and certainly over the two years of the COVID uh, pandemic, we have um, had some really significant staff issues in different pockets of the workforce, particularly those who are front facing. There's no doubt about that. That's not a Falkirk issue, though. That's a Scotland wide issue. In fact, it's a UK wide issue, um, the types of issues that you would expect with front facing staff. To support that, we put in place quite a wide range of wellbeing support. There is a um, high level of information on our website in particular areas such as um, the Health and Social Care Partnership. They've done specific pieces of work with their staff to support wellbeing. Um, and that certainly helped. Um, but clearly you will still see some employees, as you will right across society, some individuals still um, struggling with the impact of COVID. So we need to continue that work, but the absence I think that um, is referred to within the report is as much about that as it is about some of the shortages we're now experiencing. Because over the COVID period, there were a number of individuals in all walks of life who took life changing decisions about their future. And we've seen employees leave, we've seen, uh, and this isn't just about Falkirk, right across public sector, we've seen employees leave, we do have areas where we have shortages. That's meaning that we're having to change our workforce plans for these areas, take different actions, and there's work ongoing to try and look 
at uh, different actions that we need to take in different areas. So for us, there are shortages in some of our social work and social care areas. There are shortages in key skills areas, such as IT, et cetera. So it's a range of different areas, and we need to look at a range of different actions. Our workforce plans are now being updated to support some of that, and that will be done over the next six months or so, as well as ongoing work that we need to do over that period. We also need to look at though, the, the continuation of the wellbeing support that we provide to individuals, which is really important. Um, because I think our, our worry, and you can see some of this happening, is that as we come out of COVID, there are certainly mental wellbeing issues out there for any number of individuals and certainly some of our workforce. And we need to make sure that we support that right across our workforce. Chief Executive chairs a wellbeing group, which has representation from all services and from our trade unions. And that group continues to look at actions on how we can support the workforce, both practical solutions as well as training and development, et cetera, which may um, support them via their manager, et cetera. So I hope that helps answer the question, Keegan. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Algy. Congratulations. Yeah, did. I was going to ask further questions, but you came back in and answered it towards the end, so that's fine. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Leitches, and thank you, uh, Mrs. Algy. I, I suppose uh, an observation that I would just throw in, um, you know, you've basically just indicated this is not just a, a financial issue, you know, we can't just throw money at this uh, problem. It is, it's a much wider, uh, the well-being of the uh, workforce there. Karen, would you? Um, yeah, absolutely. We need to um, continue to take cognizance of some of the impact of COVID. So it's not just about the two years of the pandemic and us starting to see ourselves coming out of that. It's about, for some individuals, it's about the long-term impact that that may have had. Um, and we need to continue to support individuals in the way that we deliver our services. Also, the way that we manage our workforce. And we've got an action plan uh, that is sitting there that all managers now have sight of and are taking actions based on this around how they support their teams to provide that ongoing different types of support individuals may require to get back to work, to be um, as fit and able and agile as they were before COVID may have hit them. This has had any number of impacts on people, whether it be the impact of staying at home for two years, whether it be impacts on you know, the loss of family members. There's such a wide range of issues out there because of the last two years that we've been in, and it's about how we support that as an organisation. Smash, and thanks very much, uh, Karen. Um, as you say, it is a wider social issue. It's not only uh, Falkirk Council. Um, does anyone have any uh, further questions at all? I'll, I'll just throw um, perhaps maybe a, a final wee question. And this is to do with uh, page 29, um, recommendation uh, number three. Um, <clears throat> Work to engage with those who are facing digital deficits. Um, apparently, some work has been ongoing <clears throat> uh, since then, the pandemic. Can we can we have a, 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 an update on how we feel that we're doing uh, with that? How progress is being made to engage with um, potentially uh, the most vulnerable in uh, in the council area? Um, don't know if that's Mr. Laurie or again uh, Mrs. Algy. Mira, I'm happy to to come in there, and Mr. Laurie may wish to commit. Uh, Mr. Naylor actually may wish to come in in some of the work that's been done in schools as well to support some of this. Um, so there is work that's ongoing through our digital communities project, which is part of our Council of the Future Transformation program. That's uh, aimed at tackling a number of different areas of digital exclusion. So it's been about um, trying to ensure that some of the uh, individuals and families out there who may not be able to afford either devices or um, if they've got a device, the connectivity to access digital services, to try and provide them with some support, making use of some of the national funding that's out and about and making sure they can access that and get these devices or connectivity. It's also been about trying to put in place some sort of development work to help them understand how to use these devices, because for some individuals, they may never have used some of that. 
And there are clearly benefits, not just in accessing services, but in also in some cases accessing cheaper um, products which may support the cost of living crisis that, that we're now seeing. So there's a, th that work is ongoing and it's linked into wider work we're doing around Wi-Fi in town centres, which would um, reduce the cost of trying to connect to the internet, etc. So it's a big piece of work and an ongoing project. But there's also a lot of work going on in schools as well with pupils. And if, if you're uh, comfortable convening, I would hand over to Mr Naylor to maybe uh, update you on that as well. Thanks. You just uh, jumped in. I was just about to ask uh, Mr Naylor for uh, his comments on that. Thanks very much, uh, Cam. Thank you, convener. Um, we, we have completed the rollout of our connected uh, Falkirk digital device. Uh, so all, all of our uh, senior pupils and our uh, most senior pupils in primary schools now have uh, an iPad. For those that have difficulty having access at home, we've also uh, provided some families with uh, what might be commonly known as dongles. So if, if there's families that don't have internet access, we've provided mobile data packages that allow these devices to be connected to the internet uh, in, in children's homes. So we continue to teach and uh, utilize the, the possibilities afforded by these, these iPads. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm confident that we've now got pretty much universal coverage for all of our children. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Nella. That's very encouraging. Um, I don't see that uh, we will have all of the solutions, but it looks as if very much as if we are positively engaging to try and uh, answer some problems that may be out there in the uh, in the, the community area. Um, we can move on. I've got, Another a couple of wee questions here. Um, I'll take uh, page 22, recommendation three. Um, there's a wider leadership development program uh, has been uh, completed. How do we how do we assess uh, how how successful that um, development program has been? Maybe Mr. Laurie. <clears throat> yeah, thank you, um, convener. It's a it's a really interesting question uh, because um, in our best value action plan, we've set out quite a number of um, actions that we're going to take to try and strengthen collaborative leadership um, within the um, council, and we're progressing these. Um, actions and you know some of the, the sessions we've already spoken about the you know, the joint um, work on um, equalities other shared training sessions there's a number of actions that we need to um, to take forward because I think particularly given the the nature and the scale of the decisions that are going to be coming in front of the council in the forthcoming period the ability to work um, collectively um, to find the best solutions and that's partly about officers working um, collectively, and I think that's something where um, we've made a lot of progress um, with changes in the council over the last uh, year or 18 months. Um, but also the ability of um, councillors to work collectively to find the best way forward when, as I say, you'll be um, you'll be faced with really difficult decisions over the coming period because of the financial crisis um, that we're in. I think that the Really, the best measure of whether we've made progress on these is not whether we can tick off the actions in our best value action plan, but whether we see the evidence that the council is working better in a collaborative cross party um, manner. I think we're at early stage in um, relation to that. I think that collaboration will be really tested in the coming period because of the kind of budget decisions which will be. Um, coming forward, but it's something that I think is very difficult to um, it's difficult to measure because ultimately it's about you know how the council feels, how it how it's collaborating, whether it's a constructive um, joined up approach we're managing to take 
um, as a council. I don't know if Karen wants to uh, give what might be a more scientific um, answer to that, but I, I suppose I'm just reflecting on the, the real difficulty of measuring something which is by its nature uh, quite difficult to measure. Mrs. Algie. I think agree entirely with what Mr. Laurie has said, and, and I, I don't know that much further to add. I suppose the proof is in the pudding around um, just exactly just following through what Mr Laurie said there about whether we get to the position of an agreed financial strategy, whether we see improvements in our performance indicators. And just in a very practical sense for officers, we have also put in place a 360 feedback process with our colleagues. So that, in a sense, will also give us some insight into the changes that the development work is actually making, certainly for officers. Uh, and some feedback from our colleagues across the council about whether they can see that having an impact. So that's probably all I would add to that. Thank you, convener. Thank you, Mrs. Algy. Um, unless we have anything further, I have one final um, question, a couple of questions to do with a final point. So on page 26 and a, a recommendation eight, uh, within the um, current assessment, uh, it advises that um, it states here, uh, just quoting from it, it's difficult to ensure reserves are used in a sustainable way. Can I just ask for some clarifications, probably Mrs. Templeman, um, what's actually meant by uh, that, uh, Amanda? I'll come back in a wee bit later, but if you could maybe just advise me on that. Thank you, convener. I think um, the way I would try to explain it is that we the reserves should be able to buy us a little bit of time. So if, for example, we had a savings, well, if I go back fundamentally, our income needs to match our expenditure and our reserves are there either for sort of a rainy day for contingency or we can use them sustainably in the sense that if we wanted to make a service delivery change that was going to um, generate a saving, we could say, well, we'll use reserves for the first year because that saving is going to take two day, um, a year and a half, for example, to deliver. So we're using reserves just to buy us a little bit of time, but we know that we are going to be in a sustainable position because we're taking action to make our income and expenditure align with each other. Um, where it becomes unsustainable is if we're not taking those underlying actions to make our income and expenditure match, and instead we're relying on our reserves to help bridge that gap. And that's what we've been criticised for in the past, and that's the kind of approach that we need to, to get away from. Does that answer your question, convener? I think it's a wonderful illustration, uh, uh, Amanda, just as you say, where we do dip into reserves uh, on a short term basis of perhaps potentially improving uh, service delivery, which also um, produces a, a financial saving, if you like. So the, the reserves are then virtually topped up by the benefit of that saving. So I thought it was a, it was a, nice, uh, a nice example. I'm going to ask a, a, a follow-up question to that, um, and it, it may already have been answered in your answer there. Um, when do we, how do we, uh, how do we decide to dip into reserves? Or how have we decided to dip into reserves in the past? The example you gave of uh, potential um, financial savings, um, you know, with uh, modifying a service delivery is a good point. But we have we've been criticised in the past for basically just dipping into the reserves. How do we, when do we decide to dip into reserves? I'm, I suppose I'm asking what what was the criticism? of us just dipping into reserves to, uh, to satisfy uh, budget needs? Uh, thank you, convener. I think it's a, it's a good question. The, the decision to use reserves is usually taken at the budget um, meeting. I think part of the, 
the criticism we've had is that our budgets are very much focused on just getting over the next year and getting the next year's budget approved. So we're not taking that um, sort of more medium term view where we can see, for example, that we're taking decisions that may affect the year two budget or the year, year three budget, and that that will give us some reassurance that we're using those reserves sustainably. Instead, our budgets and our decision making has been very focused on that sort of year to year, just getting the next year out of the way. So I think what will support um, or what will reassure the auditors is if they start to see um, officers bringing uh, sort of more medium term decisions to members and members accepting and approving some of those decisions in any case, which suggests that we're taking that more medium term view rather than just having all decisions come to an annual budget meeting and all those decisions really just being focused on what will happen in the next year. Thank you, Amanda. I think you have uh, you, you basically answered what was going to be my follow up uh, question to that. How do we break that cycle? But you've suggested there council officers bring forward uh, a, a more medium term approach to uh, budget preparation can only be to the good. Councillor Spears, I see your hand up. Could uh, you anything? Uh, thank, thank you. Just an observation uh, to Amanda. Would you say we are approaching a rainy day situation <laughs> and that um, it's all very well to say we shouldn't dip into reserves, but when uh, when times are tough, that's what reserves are there for. Or, or do we intend just to increase the council tax or pursue asset re realisation to try and help us through the financial difficulties we're going to be in? I think this is going to be one of the most crucial budgets for the council. And that, um, thank God we've got reserves. So I would suggest the rainy day is here. I don't know if uh, Mrs. Templeman was suggesting an umbrella there, but <laughs> do you want to come back in, uh, Amanda, at all? No? Yes, thank you, Convener, um, and thank you, Councillor Spears. I think, I think part of the difficulty we have is that arguably we could say that we've been facing a rainy day for quite some time. So, for example, uh, COVID was one of those examples where um, it was an extreme event, it was a one-off and, and actually application of reserves uh, to support um, our local communities and, um, for example, if we needed to buy a raft of PPE or something, those, that's a valid use of reserves and we are, we are allowed to do that. Um, I think the difficulty we have is that, and possibly because of how difficult the last few years have, have been, um, we have significantly eaten into our reserves, so we're not sitting with big pots that are available to us anymore. And the problem is that if we do have another um, one off extreme event, we may not have enough reserves sitting to help us manage that. And that's really where we need to have our reserves sitting at a sustainable level. So you know, at this point in time, we're projecting to really be at the floor of what we think is a sustainable level of reserves. The problem, as I say, and the problem is that if we are hit with another significant event, a sh an economic shock, um, we have less room to manoeuvre and less flexibility. So that's where the, having a, a, a good balance of reserves is really important. But we have used significant amounts of reserves in the last couple of years. OK, um, so if we don't use the reserves, we need to rely on other sources that I mentioned previously. I, I, through you, Convener, I think fundamentally what we need to do as a council is align our expenditure and our income. And we have two effective ways to do that. One is to increase our income, which we know we're limited in doing. So, um, you know, we, we've been... We've had indications from the Scottish Government that our grant will be flat cash, our other income, main income source is council tax, but that's a relatively small proportion um, of our income. And then the other option is to reduce our costs. And that's where the chat, the particularly difficult decisions um, 
will no doubt be coming in front of members. But those, okay. are, those are the two options. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, thanks, uh, Councillor Smears. Thanks for the responses there, uh, uh, Amanda. And I think we have uh, one final question from uh, Provost Bissett. Hey, hey, thanks, Convener. Uh, page 23, recommendation five. As part of the work to reflect the current social, economic, and environmental changes in Falkirk, what engagement work is being undertaken to involve all community groups? And, uh, I don't know if that would be uh, Mrs. Algy or uh, the Chief Exec, probably Mrs. Algy, I think. Thank you, Convener. Um, it's a really important point, Convener, and I think there's work that does need to be done on different aspects of the options that will come forward to members. So we do have a communities team. Members will, will hopefully be aware of that, and that communities team continues to work with our communities on different aspects. But as we go through our budget process, that's where we need to ensure that we're taking uh, the right matters out to our communities for appropriate engagement. So the example would be the library plan that we spoke to members about a couple of weeks ago at Council, where we're now going out to communities to engage on what um, they feel we should be doing to make our libraries more efficient, but to still deliver a library service. So it's that type of work that we continue to do and that is also forming part of the discussions that officers are having on the various budget options that we're considering to address uh, the challenges that we face ahead of us. I hope that helps answer the question. Thank you. Provost Bissett. Aye, that, that's fine. It just they touch on locality planning. Are we, have we got plans for more locality plans across the Falkirk District? I know there was a draft one proposed for Bainsford and Lang Lees, and I think there was might have been one for Denny. Um, are we got plans to look at Bone Ace and Gainsworth as well, for example? Karen? Thank you, Convener. Um, the team are certainly working with all the different community groups, so they will aim to develop as many of these plans as we can in terms of what the communities want. Convener, if, it, if it's acceptable, what I can do is maybe get one of the community's team to uh, arrange for a committee to get an update on which plans are out there and which are, are in progress if that's acceptable. Thanks. A terrific suggestion, uh, Mrs. Algy. Thank you for that. Um, Provost, anything? No, yeah, no fine. Thanks. Convener. Thank you. Um, well, if there are no further questions, and I don't see any other hands up. Um, thank you very much, uh, everyone, for your attendance. It's been a, a very worthwhile um, uh, exercise today, I think. Um, we obviously will be uh, developing and learning the quality impact assessment. Uh, I look forward to the training and I'll go and look for that uh, video, Mrs. Algy. Thank you very much. Appreciate your attendance, everyone. Thank you.